But today, it, this webinar is how to achieve robust PCB design workflow for signal integrity. A little bit about me, my name is Tim Wang Lee, and I'm from Keysight Technologies. My background is in signal integrity. Right now, I'm a PhD candidate in University of Colorado in Boulder, learning a lot more about simulation and measurement correlation. And I'm almost done with my my degree, and I'm just I just can't wait to for COVID to finish and for my PhD degree to finish. Now, before I do anything else, I want to answer the question how to achieve robust PCB design workflow. Well, for uh, three things. First, you have to understand the possible root causes of si signal integrity issues. Well, we we'll cover in the presentation. And second, you want to make sure you use uh, electronic design automation, EDA tool software to, cr to create some kind of prototype, a virtual prototypes that you can, you can play, play with. And finally, you want to relay, rely on a dependable manufacturer for layout, fabrication, and assembly, and that will be Sierra circuits. So here is a, a workflow in, in a simplified form. First, you have the early design phase, you have the PCB layout phase, then you have the PCB fabrication phase. Now, in the first part, you know, basically you have system block diagrams, schematics, things like that. Going into the PCB layout in the middle, you start specifying your stack up and your layout design. Finally, you go to the PCB fabrication where a manufacturing and assembly are done. Now with Keysight can really help you with our software ADS is, you know, the early design part. With Sierra Circus, of course, and the PCB fabrication. But now the worlds are emerging. The, word, the worlds are emerging our software is slowly creeping into the PCB layout. Not as good as the other layout tools, but it's also Sierra Circuit is taking its place into the PCB layout and simulation place. Now in the middle, we have this virtual prototype, which is very powerful, that can help you troubleshoot and understand your channel more. Now, how does that look like? Let me introduce you to engineering engineer tread and his traditional design approach. He has usually a design based on vendor guidance and fabricate prototype and measure the performance. That's a traditional approach where if I give it a score, it's a very practical, I have a five and practicality, effort, low effort because you are basing it on a existing design. It's kind of hard to troubleshoot and it's kind of, it's kind of hard, to, hard to do the what if analysis. And here is a summary. It's easy to fabricate, but you need experience to know where to look for problems. And it's really difficult to perform the what if analysis. A second is engineering, engineer Rob and his robust design approach, which we're introducing today, is you create a virtual design prototype. You simulate and validate your prototype. You fabricate the prototype. And finally, you, you measure and you verify the performance. What this does to us is, it's still very practical, it's at a five. Effort is a little higher, but what we get out for putting a little more time is its ability to get, get you to troubleshoot and to do what if analysis. The punchline here is that you invest a little more time, but you get a lot in return. You see the score here, the troubleshooting score is too, too higher than the old traditional approach. And the ability to do what if analysis in your robust design workflow with a virtual prototype is five times better. So that's why we need to focus on this new and robust design approach. Now, if you have any questions right now, you can put it in chat. I'm monitoring the chat. If not, we're gonna move on to the approach. So today we're gonna cover all the way from understanding the signal integrity issues, the rule of thumbs, estimations, to creating a virtual prototype into the layout and 3D extraction. So we'll, we'll do that last. And then analysis, come back to the virtual prototype. That is the what if analysis and troubleshooting cycle here. In the process, we'll look at eye diagrams, mixed mode S parameters, TDR, and single pulse response. And all with, with all this, it's very important to anticipate before you simulate. It's very easy to just press the simulate button or to look at a measurement. But as engineers, we need to know what we're gonna see 
before we simulate or before we measure it. So that's the other thing that is going to be important today is anticipate before we perform a simulation or measurement. Here is an example we're going to walk through today. It's going to be a USB serial link where I have the USB connector on the right hand side and we have some controller in the middle. And there, there are a few questions that we're going to answer by looking at the rule of thumb estimations and virtual prototype. So the questions are number one, what I metric should I follow? Number two, how long can my differential trace be? And number three, what trace width should I expect with my stack up? So it's a hierarchical approach where you go, well, what's the top level metric? And second, how can, how long? And then what's the trace width? So then we can build up on our design. So here are the rule of thumbs that we're gonna cover today. The first one is A73 rule. The second one is for loss, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 dB per inch per gigahertz. Three is about impedance, four also impedance, and five is about step resonance. And I promise you there will not be a, a quiz at the end, but I will have a slide with all these, all these rules, the rules summarized and send it to you after the, the webinar. Now first, and final, so at, at the end, we're gonna compare what's with virtual prototype and what is real. So this is the Xilinx ZCU 104X 104 board. Right, so first thing we're gonna do is create a virtual prototype and look at that troubleshooting, what if analysis and design exploration, the virtuous simulation cycle. The first question before I ask is, I will give you some detail. We're gonna do the start experiment together. The, trans the transmitter is operating at five gigabit per second and the RX is right here. And the question is, well, what I metric should I follow given that the data rate is five gigabit per second and the RX is right there. Out comes the standard. You know, the first thing I do with any design is, you know, you pull out the standard and ask the standard, what can I find in the standard? The result is, well, if you look over here, there are all these specs on deterministic jitter, I high and total jitter, oh, all these nodes, right? It's measured after receiver equalization function. It is hard to design with all these testing specs because it's designed to test. Not, de not that these specs are not helping you to design, right? So that's why we have the A73 rule. The A7 says A73 rule says that if you have A dB of loss at Nyquist frequency, which is half the NRZ data rate, you're gonna approximately get a 75% of UI, meaning that a 25% UI jitter from ISI inter symbol interference. And 30%, that's a three, it's a I height. How does it look like? It looks like if you have S21, insertion loss look like that, and this is the Nyquist frequency at minus ADB of loss, then out comes the I, out comes the I that's gonna look something like this. 75% of I width and 30% of I height. All right, so here is a setup, five gigabit per, five gigabit per second, 25, 2.5 gigahertz, Right sign 15 picosecond. Applying the A73 rule, I'm gonna see this result over here. Right here, on the horizontal axis, there's our horizontal jitter, about 75%, and on the top, 30% I height. Now I know what you're thinking. How does this look like compared to the standards requirement? Well, here is what the standard look like, the eye mask from standard. Using the A73, you will have plenty clearance compared to the eye mask from the standard. Now, remember when we're doing A73, we didn't put in any jitter or any duty cycle distortion. It's just pure ISI. So this gives you a really good starting point for your design. 
considering only frequency dependent loss. All right, we'll still have plenty of room for the eye. So we can save margins for reflection noise, random jitter, and other deterministic jitter. That's the A73 rule. Okay, so we cross that one. What eye metric should I follow? A73, ADB of loss, 75 dB unit interval, and 30% of eye height, right there. Now the second question is, how long can my differential trace be? Right, you have a connector going to a controller. You have to know what's putting us, uh, what, what are limiting factors for the length of the trace, which will invoke is a 0.1 to 0.2 dB per inch per gigahertz rule for loss estimation. Now given a 50 ohm transmission line 10 inches, this is a de-embedded measurement, right? Given that, given that measurement, I can divide that by the frequency and then divide that by 10 inches. What this tells me is no, up to from five gigahertz up to 40 gigahertz, it's a really flat loss curve right here. And if I want to play it safe, instead of calling it 0.08 dB, I call it 0.1 dB. Now, depending on what kind of substrate you use, it could be lower or higher. But generally, if you have 50 ohm transmission line, 0.1 to 0.2 dB loss per inch per gigahertz is a really, really great metric to use. I use this all the time. Now, once we have these two rules, we can estimate the trace length given. I, you do a little math, use the ADB divided by the 0.2 on the high end. I come up with 16 inches on the right. Once I can plot 16 inch to have ADB of loss at Nyquist 2.5 gigahertz. If I plot that on a curve on, with a horizontal axis as data rate, at five gigabit per second, and that's 16 inches. Now an, an experiment is, well, how would that look like if I keep increasing my data rate? It's gonna look something like this. The higher data rate you go, the shorter the length acceptable given the A73 rule. This explains a lot, right? The higher the data rate you go, the shorter you are gonna be allowing your trace to be. Punchline here is, there are gonna be more signal integrity problems with longer lines at higher data rates. Any questions so far? Okay, entering in chat or q and I will be answering that. Let me look at the chat real quick. All right, so no questions so far. Very good. I'll keep going. Check QA. All right. Yes, I have a question. Is this F44? Yes, all the substrate right now I'm assuming is F44. If you have, say, Mectron or any other substrates, you know, 3.3, .3, that's close to 4. So the math works out approximately. That's why I have a range here 0.1 to 0 0.2 TB loss. It's meant for a rule of thumb and a first order approximation. Good, we're gonna move on. Answer the second question, how long is gonna be? As long as 16 inches, it's fine. The third question is, well, what trace width should I expect with my stack up? Here is the trace impedance. And here is, is where things are gonna get really interactive. Here is my stack up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, I think, almost 16 to, to 20 layers of board for the Xilinx board. Now here, what I can do is look at a single cross section here for single-ended single -ended microstrip, All right? What I'll do then is I'll specify a width, six mil. That is the narrowest usually if you don't pay premium for special fabrication. Six mil is, is the standard narrowest line. If I have the substrate height to be 3.5 mils, what do you expect 
the impedance to be given this setup? The height is 3.5 mils and the width is 6 mils. What is the characteristic impedance of this setup? If you enter one, you're going to be saying in chat 30 ohms, enter two, 50, three, 75, and four is I need a field solver. So you can start entering in chat and I will check out what the thing is. I have the number, if you answer number one is <clears throat> 30 ohm, two is 50, three, 75, four is I need a field solver. Give it a minute or so. I'm gonna start a timer. <clears throat> okay. All right. Great. I right, we'll have answers rolling in. Good, good. It's okay. You don't. You, if you need to call a friend. All right. So a minute is up. We have a few. Actually, we have a quite a uh, good spread, but mostly says. I would say it's a two, three, or four, or one. Actually, not many choose one. All right. Well, thanks for the participation. We're gonna reveal the answer drum roll, please. The answer is about 50 ohms. So here, the single-ended microstrip impedance. The rule of thumb is, if the width over height is about two, the impedance is gonna be about 50 ohms. So if I do a quick, quick math here, right now, the Width over height is about 1.7, which I'm gonna call is close to two, so it's 50 ohms. Now the cool thing about uh, knowing these rule of thumb is, it's a great way to do a quick estimation of what trace width you need, right? Given a substrate height 3.5, you know if you have seven mil width, that's about 50 ohms. So right off the bat, once you look at the you look at your stack up, you will know what is the 50 ohm trace width. Now, of course, if you make it narrower, it's going to be higher impedance. A wider, lower impedance. So I think I have a few, a few more questions. I think another question is this, uh, it's a similar setup, but right now we we don't need you don't need the field solver anymore because you know we're approximating. Uh, my professor Eric Bogatin likes to say. A, a okay answer now is better than a great answer later. Well, when everything comes down to it, there's a deadline, there's a time crunch, you don't want to spend an hour or two hours to, to set things up in the field solver. If you can get a okay answer right off the bat, right? So now, once we're getting used to this setup, we're gonna take a step forward. So here's the summary. If it's a single-ended microstrip, the impedance, the width over height is about two. You can expect the single-ended impedance to be about 50. Now we're gonna make it a edge coupled differential pair. Given that the trace width is still six mils for both of them, not gonna trick you. And the spacing is three times of the trace width. What would you expect the impedance, the differential impedance of this channel to be, this cross section to be. Number one is 88.8 .8 ohms. That's oddly specific. Number two, about 100. Number three, 75. And number four, I need a field solver. And we can start another minute. I'm gonna monitor chat. So now I'm gonna get the hint is the spacing is three times the trace width, meaning that they're not really coupled. Yeah, they're not really coupled. 
So I'm gonna monitor chat. So feel free to enter in chat what uh what your thought is on this specific setup. Oh, let me see if I can pull up chat real quick. Yes, and the the rule of thumb here assume FR4. And it would be different based on different dielectric constant. But uh, for high speed boards, generally speaking, the if you are using FR4 or HR from Isola or Mectron, Mectron 6, 7, low loss content, when the dielectric is about 3.3 to 4, the math works out similar. Right? So it's not exactly two times. That's why I have a product. These are all the rule of thumbs. If you really want to get down to the 0.1, 0.2 dB margin that you're looking at, then I would really suggest a field solder will be a good way to go. But overall, a good rule of thumb here is for FR4. So this is it's going to be useful right now. Oh, there we go. We got a bunch of, let me, let me double check. Let me roll back a little bit. Got a lot of twos, a lot of 100 ohms. One ounce copper, one ounce copper. One ounce copper. And as it turns out, the thickness, since we're, we're looking at uh, the whole cross section, the, the whole thickness isn't playing, it's not a, a first order factor in terms of the impedance. But that's a good question. About a bunch of 100 ohms, right? Two, three. I give it another 30 seconds. Good, no four. Very good, very good, no fours. So we are on we are our own field solver today. We know how to to find the impedance based on our rule of thumb. Three, two, good. Very good. Okay. All right, I'm gonna reveal the answer. So for this setup, based on the hint here, since a three three trace width. We know the single ended is 50 ohm on each side. And since they are three trace width apart, they are considered uncoupled. So it's gonna be the differential impedance is going to be twice of that single ended impedance. I.e. it's gonna be 100 ohms. The answer is number two. Out comes another rule of thumb. If the spacing is three times of the trace width, then the differential impedance is twice the single ended. And we know the single ended is 50 ohms. So it's about 100 ohms. Great. Now the third one is, well, how about strip line? Because you're gonna run the strip line on inner layers to to really avoid the cross talk, firing cross talk for, for channels that you have that is very, very sensitive to, to noise. Here is what we're gonna do. We have H small is, three mils and large is 3.5. So that's the prepreg and the core, depending on what uh, thickness you have. If the trace width is three mils, here I'm gonna give you the punch line here, the width over the H, the smaller one, if it's the, the ratio is one, then it's about 50 ohms. So you can kind of test based on your stack up, if you have an O stack up in your uh, repository or some file somewhere, you know, pull it up and take a look at it if you have a impedance controlled stack up, you will see that when you have an inner, inner layer, you take the width of the trace over the height of the smaller height, the single ended impedance is gonna be about 50 ohms. The 50 ohm line is gonna have that ratio. Similarly, if the spacing is three times of the trace width, like I'm showing here on the right, three times the trace width, the impedance is gonna be about 100 ohms if they're uncoupled. Now the question here is, right, we, we, we got all the impedance out of the way. What would happen if I were to move the traces a little bit closer to each other, right? They're now uncoupled, three traces with the part. If I were to move them closer together, what is it gonna be? Is it gonna increase the differential impedance or two, decrease the differential impedance, or three, the differential impedance is gonna stay the same. Assuming all the other things are the same, 
Uh, what is going to happen? This is our last question. Last polling question. It's going to increase number one, decrease number two, or stay the same number three, and no number four. So we're going to not, not going to do number four today because we are all, we are our own field solver today. Okay, I will. I should keep it 30 seconds. Let me see if I have any questions right now. We got decrease, very good. We got a couple increases. Let's see, I'm, I'm doing a quick over Q and A. Two, two, another 30 seconds. Very good. Very good. Very good. All right, another 10 seconds, nine, eight, seven, six. Right, I'm gonna close the poll. I think the majority thinks it's gonna decrease and it is the case. When you move the different, uh, the traces closer together, the differential impedance is gonna decrease. That's why when you get them closer together, you need to make the line narrower to increase the differential impedance. So that's another rule of thumb that we need to remember is, you know, when you move two differential traces together closer, you can decrease the differential impedance. Okay, we answer question one, two, and three, just to pull up a little big picture here. We're trying to design this USB to the controller connection and we ask three big questions and we answer all of them. Now it comes down to well how are we gonna well we, how are we gonna design it schematic wise. Here is a quick demo of CILD that is the controlled impedance line designer in ADS a Kisa ADS that's gonna showcase how you can quickly design a channel. It's a quick video and I'm gonna show you I'm gonna walk walk that through with you this is a quick video and here we go so once you define the stack up here in ads you, you will go to the cild window bring up the stack up now we mentioned for micro strip line it has to be twice the height is 3.5 so i'll enter in the width to be seven so enter seven and click simulate I expect the impedance to be about 50. And there we go, right now we are at 46, which is really darn close to be 50 ohms, right? And if you optimize it, there's an optimization that you can do, right? You can optimize it to, to 50. And what I was showing here is you can actually export what you have designed into a channel right there. You can drop it down and do a channel simulation. Now, once you have done the channel simulation, this is what it looks like. You have on the left here is your TX transmitting at five gigabit per second. And the middle is what we talked about using the A75 or A73, pardon me. We come up with the 16 inches and the receiver. And this is the stack up. In the, you drop it down and well, you know, we expect it to be eye to be open and there it is. The eye is open because 16 inches we can tolerate. Next is looking at well, what's the percentage UI, right? In in the strip line case, we have actually 86% given a 16 inch. So given the A73 rule, you know, 70 you're gonna get more than 75% most of the time. But that's a good starting point. And 
the eye height is about 38% of the max, which is within the tolerance, right? It's all clearing the mask. Next, we're gonna compare our design, right? Our 16 inch design to a real fabricated board, which, is, which looks like this. To do that, we will need to import the layout to a 3D environment to simulate the board because between layers, you have these cross layer coupling that needs to be taken up account in real life. So what we need to do is, you know, looking at all these components, we're gonna find that trace, what is really, really is designed and look at the performance. So here is another uh, demo that I will share with you. It, that's the Kisa ADS SI Pro that is going to be, what we're gonna be using and I will start the video right now. So here is a typical Kisa ADS window. And to import your design, it could be an ODB++ or Allegro BRD. What you'll do is go to the file and design, and you can import the Gerber BRD ODB++ in here. Once you find your favorite type of design file, you find, you locate, the, the file source and you can import it. And here is how it looks like in a 2D environment, the layout window. Once you find that SIPI Pro icon, you click on the SI Pro, it, you click it, it's gonna take in that 2D layout into a 3D view. Within this 3D view, you can do many manipulations. You can zoom in and out, looking at different layers and you can actually Select the nets. It's a net-based simulation tool. It knows the net. And you can do many, many, many manipulations with the net and simulation. Once you start SI Pro and start looking at 3D, uh, we'll have another uh, tool that we can look at the design. Right, so here is what it looks like in 3D. Now, the question we need to ask is, what do we expect? You cannot just hit simulate. We have to anticipate what we're gonna simulate, and here's what we expect. Based on the TX is five dB, uh, five gigabit per second, at Nyquist, 2.5 gigahertz. The design has seven inches of trace on top. That means, you know, the table here, I'm gonna expect about 1.75 dB of loss to 3.5. That's what we expect. And if we look at the simulation result, this is what we expect. This is gonna be the curve at that point. Now, if I looked at the 3D result, it's gonna look something like this. If I lay on top of that straight line, on, on the dotted line, well, it's great. I expected about 1.75 to 3.5 dB of loss at Nyquist, 2.5 gigahertz, and I'm getting minus 3 dB. It's really within what are the window of my expectation, but I know what you're thinking. Come on, Tim, what's happening at 10 gigahertz? There is obviously something fishy happening at 10 gigahertz. Can you address that for me? Sure, that's what I'm here for. Let's take a look at what's happening at 10 gigahertz. So, so this, is, this comes to our virtuous simulation cycle, right? We finish all the expectations, all the virtual prototype. Now, we have a question. We can do a troubleshooting session really quickly. Now we have a virtual prototype. What I do is gonna be, I looked at the 3D environment, right? I look at the 3D layout, take a closer look, at the USB TX, and I have, this is my RX right there. I zoom in, I see, okay, this is the trace, there's the via. Now, there is that ESD dial that's required for the USB traces to work. If I remove that and look at these trace, these pads, and look at the length, they're about 0.15 inches. Well, if I, don't, I, if I didn't do anything, you know, just simulate the entire channel and not do anything about these traces, 
these are going to be like stubs. Right? The connection to ESD diode, they're going to act like stubs. To confirm my guess, this is my suspicion, I need to confirm it. So here I need to look at the, the stub resonance. Given the, the length of that stub, it's about 150 mils. I do a little quick math here to using FR4, as I assume, throughout this tutorial. The resonant frequency of such a stub is about 1.5 divided by the length. Now do some mental math. The resonance is going to be at 10 gigahertz. Isn't that great? It's soft. Or it's, that's the mystery. That was the frequency of resonance we looked at in our 3D simulation. So here, we had the stub is 150. Now we can create that virtual prototype. Remember, we plopped down a 7-inch right there. And I can create another section of transmission line that is 150 mils. Now, I would expect this one to create the same resonance signature as I've seen, as I've seen in a 3D EM simulation. All right, so this will help me understand the behavior. Sure enough, so this is without the stub. This is the stub right there. This is when I simulate with the stub. Now, revealing the answer, voila. When we include that 150 mil stub transmission line here, we really do see a resonance close to 10 gigahertz. That answers our question. That confirms our guess that the ESC connections are behaving like a stub. Right, so that this is this is the consistency check that we need to do. So we have confirmed. So now the second thing is we need to confirm the location by using a TDR. We look at this point; it should be fairly close, right? I should see the stub coming out right out. And the TDR, sure enough, we have low impedance right in front of us. So I'm confirming that the stub is actually creating by the connection to the ESD. Well, now you're gonna ask me, Tim, great, what are we gonna do? First, let's take a step back. We expect the eye diagram to be open because it's A73, A7 seven inches right here. This is our 3D EM simulation. We troubleshoot at using our virtual prototype, seeing that, oh, there's a dip, but we solved it. But how is this gonna impact my eye? Well, my guess is it's going to be far enough away from the Nyquist. It's not going to have a big impact. So here it is, right here, going through the channel over the eye mask. The eye is still open because at the Nyquist, we're still allowing, allowing only minus 3 dB. And the resonance is far, far out enough that it's not going to create any vertical collapse or horizontal collapse. Now, the thing we can do is what if analysis. We can perform jitter, what if analysis. You know, what if I include 0.04 UI of jitter? So is it going to be okay? Here it is. Here is an example. The contour at 1e to the minus 12. That looks kind of dangerous, right? So then we can use design exploration in ADS, in, in software, to help us open up the eye. So in this case, we're going to use a single pulse response to help us troubleshoot. A single pulse response is where you enter, or send in a pulse with a specific rise time and data rate and observe that response on the output. So here, given the input, that's the channel on the left, we have this output. If we mark the maximum as the cursor and using our one interval as the timing step. What comes before are the precursor. What comes after are the postcursors. Well, we can identify the pre and postcursors here. This is a great way to find the number of taps needed for FFE or DFE. So if you have not looked at single pulse response, I strongly suggest you to take a look at my other publications, which I'll include in the resources slides. This is a great tool to have just to know, just so you know, you know what you can do. 
The other thing is you can use a single pulse response to understand CTLE EQ from the standard. So how does, oh, hold on. My slide is telling me anticipate before I simulate. All right, what do I, what do I expect from the CTLE? Because I know that it's trying to boost up the whatever is at the Nyquist. At low frequency, I'm having a minus three dB. That means my the height of my single pulse is gonna be a little lower because I have some loss at low frequency. By the same time, the pulse is gonna look pretty sharp because I have a boost at the Nyquist. So let's see if my simulation result agrees with my anticipation. There it is. The blue curve looks a little different than I expected, but we can see that the peak has increased because of that boost of Nyquist. So this is what we can do with virtual prototype. So this is CTLE. Now the question to ask is, well, does it open up the eye? Does it open up the eye? Let's see. Now, before CTLE, it looks something like this. After, it opens up the CTLE, opens up the eye. So before, we're a little dangerous. We're on the cusp here. But after CTLE, we really have a lot more margin at 1e e to the minus 12. So that was the virtual simulation cycle that we just created. Now, we have to take a step back and look at the big picture, right? The summary is, well, we started out with the rule of thumbs. We have three interactive rule of thumbs that we know. We went on a model, the virtual prototype. We look at the layout and use a 3D EM extraction and come back to analysis, right? In the process, we looked at S, uh, eye diagram, mixed mode S parameters, TDR, and single pulse response. What now? What now? We have to take things Oh, yes, anticipate before you simulate. I mean, my slides are always reminding me that. We have to take a step forward though, because we can only live in the simulation world for so long. We always have to take things to the next level. We've, we did that by taking a rule of thumb to the 3D layout. The next step is in a real board, a measurement workflow. Well, where we will Im implement anticipate before you measure, right? Another thing is between the 3D EM and the real board, there is the fabrication. That is what we're gonna talk about next. But then as usual, anticipate before you simulate. Now let's talk about the final piece. We have done our job simulating and anticipating, exercising our engineering judgment. It's time to fabricate. So here is a, our a quick summary of the PCB design workflow. We covered the early design and PCB layout. We briefly look at the stack up and virtual prototype. Now it's time to loop in the manufacturing and assembly, right? This is where CRS circuits can do a really good job. They have been doing a different board such as the power, power distribution network board, high density interconnect boards, and even HSA's high severe stress environment testing. So that is where they shine as a manufacturing. And they do a really good job of controlling the specs. You can do control impedance stack up. So they would actually use TDR to probe your board to make sure that the impedance that you want is correct. Be it 50 ohms, 30 something ohms, they will make sure that they, they scale your trace width or the dielectric thickness to your liking and to fit the specs. And personally, I went on their website and I went through uh, the procedure and ordered the, the boards. It is a very intuitive and they have a lot of research content. And I know Lucy here, he's a head of, con she's the head of content. They have a lot of educational content on how to design your PCB and different signal integrity content. And a colleague of mine, Heidi Barnes on the power distribution network, power integrity, there's a lot of content there. So not only is Sierra Circuit doing a great job on the manufacturing, assembling, and design, PCB design part, they're also doing a great job educating 
the customers and the potential customers on, you know, what, what to look out for, what to look out for. I would strongly suggest give CR circuits a try. And I did see in, in chat and the Q and A's like, you know what, a bunch of us are, are customers and just you know, tell your friends about how great CR circuit is. Finally, as I promised, there's a cheat sheet for all the rules. And this will be sent out to you after the seminar, after the webinar. And as always, anticipate before you measure or simulate. Finally, I want to include this slide as uh, resources, secure integrity resources, a lot of SI workshop. These are all free of charge. You can download it right now. And there is a short video on YouTube. If you go to YouTube and search signal integrity, you should find a video how to solve signal integrity problem, the basics. If you want to give ADS a try, you can go to the link here, latest download or a free trial. With that, that is the whole presentation. If you have any questions, you can answer them now. You can ask them now and I'll, I'll answer them right now. So feel free to use chat or the question. Let me. We have a question here. What is the minimum trace width with Class three, I am not sure. You have to check with either your vendor or the IPC spec. I personally cannot recall the minimum trace width for class three uh, off the top of my head. And to confirm, the rule of thumbs here assumes as, as FR4. Assumes FR4. Here's a question. I don't have any SI backgrounds. How can I learn it in the SI resources side as a great place to start? Once uh, the webinar is concluded, the slides will be sent out in a timely manner and you can start with the resources slide and make sure you reach out to, to me as well. Uh, my email is on the, the slides. You can feel free to contact me. I can point you to some resources. Yes. I will email out the entire slide set. Let's see. Let me see. Oh, question is, are there any particular edge classes for which this design framework doesn't work? I would say this design framework wor will work really well, especially for corner cases, because it is designed not to confine ourselves right but give out give ourselves uh, flexibilities especially in the controlled impedance slide designer case where you, once you know the stack up you can actually vary the substrate material properties or even the conductor roughness so this is actually giving you more freedom to explore these edge classes edge cases now, Oliver has a question. Is there any advantage or preference to running all, running differential pairs on inner layers versus on top layers for SI or externally injected or radi uh, radiative EMI reasons? Yes, for sure. That's why part of it is differential traces is good is if you assume the same kind of noise on the, the positive trace and the negative trace, so those are the, the common noises, right? And when you take the difference, the common noises will cancel each other out because they're common to both. Now, the question is, well, is there going to be a radiative ative EMI for a particular stack up? That would be a different question. There will be a whole nother webinar that we need to do on the radiative, radiative EMI, but my colleagues have been looking closer to it uh, from a PI power integrity perspective. And then would this require a less standard stack up, especially for simpler for six layer board? I would say, Oliver, from what I know, uh, EMI management is a lot about 
how you place each layer and make sure you are placing them in the right uh, proximity. But yet I'm I'm no EMI expert, so that is out of my expertise. But you know, there there are different EMI resources out there that you can you can take a look. Let's see, you have answer live. I answer live this one. Answer this one. Yeah, I will be emailing the entire set to answer live. Okay. Chat. Let me see. Chat. I think this this webinar will be on demand. I I think yes 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 it's being answered. You're welcome, Divinia. And let's see. Can we? Yes, you can always apply these techniques to lower speed. However, like we like we've seen in the the cases when we are scaling up the data rate, it makes the line shorter, right? Now imagine, you see right now we're, we're doing, if you, the, the curve we're seeing was, if we increase the data rate to the left, to, the, to, to my left, you're right, it, the line gets shorter. If the data rate goes lower, that means you can tolerate a longer line, which means for your case, Anthony, well, lower data rate is a bit easier to design just because the loss is a lower at lower data rate. But yes, you can definitely apply all these techniques, rule of thumbs, because the assumptions there is the cross sections, especially for the impedance. Well, uh, Douglas has a question. How are the rule of thumbs affected by going a higher speed material? That's why with most of the, the with, with most of the rule of thumb here, if there's a requirement for data rate, save for the loss, it's dB per inch per gigahertz. So as long as you scale your data rate to your Nyquist frequency, all these will work the same for higher data rate, high speed material. With the caveat that the material property has to be close enough to FR4. If you're using, say, silicon and uh, it's going to be different but you can always rely on your feel solver in that case and let's go through michael has a question yeah for the license calls you can always get an evaluations license for free but going further than that, we have different packages and bundles that would actually make make it easier for you to perform what you need to do with a affordable price. Yeah, Michael, make sure you con uh, reach out to me, and I'll find a a a night uh, the right person for you to, to talk to. Process variation can also be included in in the simulation as well. Slides will be available. And by these, yes, yes, yes. Answer most of the question. Well, thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Anthony. Let me double check on the questions here. Yes, Mahashi, the webinar will be on demand. I think I'm gonna answer a final question. Is there a direct way to move the TL multi-layer library stack up to the CL tool? Yeah, it's actually the control impedance line tool requires you to have the stack up. Yeah, make sure you reach out to me, anonymous attendee. I'm not sure if that's your full name. It was a joke. Yeah, reach out to me and then, you know, we can have a webinar and look at uh, what you need, what needs to be done. Thank you, Greg. And with that, I think this is our whole webinar. It's 11. Thanks for having me today. Very good to have a great crowd. Thanks for, thank you all for your participation. It's been wonderful. Thank you, Tim.